Ari, welcome. Thanks so much for having me. Pleasure to be here. So many great stories, great books, great personalities in the well-being world start with a great personal journey and story with, with someone's own personal health. And you're no different. So let's start there with your personal health journey and, and battle with. Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, I, I really wasn't very focused on fatigue and energy for most of my life, but I have been studying health science for pretty much all of my life since I was about 12 or 13 years old. Health science has really been my singular passion and obsession. And early on in those years, it was really bodybuilding. That was my world, body composition, optimization, fat loss, and muscle gain. My older brother was a, a personal trainer and an aspiring bodybuilder. He was being mentored by professional bodybuilders. And of course, like, like any good little brother, I wanted to be like big brother. So, you know, I was kind of in that world and really aspiring to, to be like big brother and to be like his mentors, these professional bodybuilders. You know, by the time I was 13, 14 years old, I was already reading, you know, college level textbooks and nutrition science and in biomechanics and exercise physiology and these kinds of things. And I, I was really obsessed and, and to some extent gifted as far as my ability to understand complex scientific topics related. And then, you know, I'd always been an athlete, always been fit, health conscious. And then something happened when I was in my mid 20s that really rocked my world and changed my whole the course of my life and, and my career. And that is that when I was living in Israel, working on a communal farm, I was exposed to Epstein-Barr virus and it hit me hard and I got mononucleosis pretty severely. I ended up losing about 30 or 40 pounds in the span, in the span of a month, almost all muscle. I became pretty emaciated. And, and really the doctors could, weren't of much help. I went to see many, many doctors. It took them weeks before they even figured out what I had. Once I had it and I was struggling with mono and struggling with chronic fatigue, they didn't really have anything to offer me. Eventually I got over the sort of the acute phase of mononucleosis where, you know, the back of my throat's filled with gigantic balls of pus that prevent me from swallowing any food. But I was left with severe chronic fatigue from that for almost a year. And in that process, I really, you know, my, my whole worldview shifted and my whole focus with regards to what I was interested in when it came to health science focus, because I saw that when you don't have energy, when you don't have this thing that I had always taken for granted in my whole life up until that point. When you don't have it, your whole life kind of falls apart. Everything in your life, you know, I had a girlfriend at the time, I had friends, I was, you know, in this farm environment with 150 other kids in their 20s from all around the world. And, you know, I, I couldn't hang out with them and, and get together with them. I had work to do, I had studies to do, and I couldn't do any of it because my body wasn't functioning and my brain wasn't functioning. And this really shifted my perspective to let me know what it's like for people who have chronic fatigue, who chronically lack the energy to do all the things they want to do in life. And from that moment on, you know, pursuing different help in the conventional medical realm, as well as looking in alternative medicine and natural health and functional medicine, I discovered, and I'm happy to talk details and at length about some of this, I, I really discovered that they didn't have much to offer people with chronic fatigue. So at that point in my mid twenties, which is over 10 years ago, that's when I really shifted my focus to, instead of becoming obsessed with the world of body composition, I shifted my focus to the science of energy levels and really dedicating my life to building out a scientific framework that allows us to understand and optimize human energy levels. Well, well, let's go there. It seems like so many of us are fatigued. So many of us are just dragging a little bit. And it, it seems like it, there's an epidemic. Let's go to energy. Well, what are we getting so wrong about energy levels? Yeah. Well, let's start with conventional medicine. Several years ago, there was a paper published in the American Journal of Family Physicians, and it's called Fatigue and Overview. And this is basically a composite, a, a compilation of the research it's sort of meant to be everything that we know about the science of why people are chronic fatigued and how to fix it. How do we treat people? So it's basically evidence-based guidelines for physicians. 
and how they should treat their, their patients with chronic fatigue. And first of all, they say, you know, this is an interesting point that a lot of people are unaware of. You know, people think that if they're dealing with a symptom like chronic lack of energy, they're going to go to their doctor and their doctor has all this amazing technology and lab testing and blood testing and all kinds of other testing that they can do, that they're going to do on them. And through all of that, they're going to figure out, you know, the, the specific causes of that person's low energy levels. Well, in this paper that I just mentioned, they actually talk about testing in, in patients with chronic fatigue. And, and first of all, they say, unless otherwise indicated, unless you suspect some specific condition, tuberculosis or something like that, you do standard blood testing. And they, they literally say in this paper, 95 out of 100 people have nothing on their blood test results that can explain their fatigue. So five out of a hundred people might get, you know, something like, oh, we figured out you have hypothyroidism or you have a- anemia and let's get you on some iron or B vitamin supplements, or you've got diabetes or something like that. But 95 out of a hundred people are literally learning nothing. And the doctors get no insight from those tests into what is an explanatory causative factor in that person's fatigue. So that's the first part. The second part is they say in this paper, here's our four treatments for chronic fatigue. And the four treatments that they have are antidepressants, cognitive behavioral therapy, a recommendation to do 30 minutes of walking per day and use stimulants as needed. That's literally all they have. You might notice as I'm listing off those four things, they don't even mention nutrition. They don't even mention sleep and circadian rhythm. You know, there's, they don't even mention environmental toxicants or so many other factors that are, are huge factors in the epidemic of chronic fatigue. So, you know, these are people, they they could have somebody with chronic fatigue coming into their office and that person might be eating nothing but McDonald's and, and, and donuts and pizza and, and French fries all day. And they won't even think to ask. What, you're, what are you eating? What does your diet look like? It's not even within their paradigm and their worldview when it comes to chronic fatigue. So needless to say, most people with chronic fatigue don't get much help from conventional doctors unless you encounter a rare conventional medical doctor who has gone above and beyond to educate themselves beyond what they get from you know, sort of the standard education. Within alternative medicine and within functional medicine and, and sort of the natural health movement, which I'm very much a part of, that world has been dominated by the hypothesis of adrenal fatigue for the last couple decades. And the basic idea there is that we have these glands that sit on top of our kidneys called the adrenal glands. They produce a hormone called cortisol that is really important in our stress response. And it does a number of different things like affects blood sugar levels and just helps mobilize energy and helps our body respond properly to stress. The problem is from this hypothesis, speaking in terms of this view, the problem is with chronic stress, it taxes the adrenal glands and taxes and taxes them over a long period of time and eventually exhausts them. And then you get low cortisol levels. And as a result of that, then you're chronically fatigued. You have the symptom of chronic fatigue. And this sounds relatively logical, And I believed it for many years. I was diagnosed, but something happened when I was diagnosed with it. I actually went and tested my cortisol and I found that I didn't have low cortisol levels. I didn't have any cortisol abnormality. So this made me a little suspicious after years of sort of believing in this whole adrenal fatigue thing. And so what I did is I started to dig into the scientific literature on the topic. It's a long story. I ended up spending about a year of my life dedicated to nothing else but sort of full-time pursuit, you know, analysis of the research on the subject of stress and fatigue and how it relates to adrenal function and cortisol levels and HPA axis function, hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis. And at the end of that, I discovered something really fascinating, which is the evidence clearly does not support the idea that adrenal fatigue is a thing or that adrenal fatigue or cortisol abnormalities are to blame in the vast majority of cases of chronic fatigue. We could talk details of that, but I'm 
hesitant to sort of go into a 20 minute you know thing on that specific topic. But, you know, at the end of at the end of all of that, you know, exploring conventional medicine, what they have to offer and exploring natural medicine, functional medicine, alternative medicine, I really discovered that <laughs> no one really knew what the hell they were doing when it comes to understanding human energy levels and why people are either fatigued or energetic. And that was really the catalyst for me to go, hey, well, maybe I need to be the one that, you know, dedicates my life to building out a scientific framework around our understanding of human energy levels and what regulates them. And from reading your work and specifically this book, it sounds like mitochondrial function plays a critical role. Yeah. So mitochondria are our cellular energy generators. And you might remember them from high school or college biology courses where they are typically talked about as these, they're talked about as the powerhouse of the cell. You might remember that term. It's sort of in every biology textbook and every biology course that anybody's ever taken. And they're the energy generators. So they're often framed in biology courses for most of the last century when they were sort of roughly a hundred years ago when sort of our, our first scientists were first sort of discovering mitochondria. Um, they've mostly been framed as these sort of mindless energy generators that just take in carbs and fats and pump out energy in the form of something called ATP, adenosine triphosphate. And that story of mitochondria as energy generators is true for the most part. They, they absolutely are doing that. But the mindless part is not true. And in the last roughly decade, there's been some really huge discoveries around mitochondria that have shifted our understanding of them from these sort of mindless energy generators, just one of many, you know, important cellular organelles to positioning them as what one brilliant mitochondrial researcher says is they are the central hub of the wheel of metabolism. So positioning these mitochondria, not just as, hey, they're another one, one of many cellular organelles, but really these are the key to our entire metabolic health. And over the last decade, especially, we have tons of research now linking mitochondrial health, every disease you can imagine from cancers to neurological disease, to heart disease, to, to diabetes and obesity. To, I mean, if you go on Google Scholar or PubMed and type in whatever disease you can think of and mitochondrial dysfunction from depression to cancer, you're going to find a whole bunch of papers on that. And we even know that they are linked to the aging process itself, to longevity and the rate of aging at the cellular level. So there's been this sort of re-envisioning of mitochondria as way, way more important than we realize. And largely thanks to the work of Dr. Robert Navio, who is a researcher and physician who runs a lab for mitochondrial medicine at the University of California, San Diego. We now know that mitochondria actually have an entire second role that is just as important as their role as energy generators. And that is their role in cellular defense. It turns out that mitochondria are like the canaries in the coal mine in our body. They are environmental sensors and they are exquisitely sensitive environmental sensors. And their job is basically to pick up on any threats or dangers that might be present in the body. So these mitochondria in our cells, again, they're not just these mindless energy generators, they're sensors that are constantly taking samples of the environment at the cellular level and basically asking the question, are we under attack? Are there any threats present that we need to respond to? And in response to that, they do something that's really important. They turn down energy production and they switch, they, they mobilize a defense response. So it turns out that mitochondria basically have two roles, energy production and cellular defense. And these two roles are mutually exclusive. So to the extent they're, they're picking up on dangers or threats present in the body, they are turning down energy production. And this is fundamentally the most upstream thing in our physiology that is actually regulating and controlling how much energy we have. It's your energy, essentially, to summarize everything I'm saying here, 
your energy, whether you have high energy levels or you're chronically fatigued, is a reflection of the degree to which your mitochondria are sensing threats that they need to respond to. If everything looks good, they have the all clear, your body's going to be in energy mode. If they're picking up on lots of threats, it's going to turn down the dial on energy production and shift resources towards cell defense. So if we're operating under the assumption that mitochondrial function is absolutely critical to our everyday energy and, and ladders up to longevity, you, know, you mentioned cancer, diabetes, heart disease, these are still the, you know, the top killers in America. And, and if mitochondrial function is at the center of all of this, what's driving dysfunction? That's a great question. So I like to think of fatigue and how our mitochondria sort of regulate our energy levels in, in terms of two fundamental factors that our energy levels are responding to. One is what's going on at the environment and lifestyle level. So are you exposed to lots of environmental toxins? Are you, for example, breathing clean air and drinking pure water and eating clean food? What does your nutrition look like? Are you eating lots of whole foods or lots of processed foods? Are you eating a bunch of junk and putting in a bunch of inflammatory crap into your body? Or are you putting in good nutritious food? Are you nutritionally sufficient or are you deficient in lots and lots of key nutrients that are needed by your body and your mitochondria to produce energy? What else is going on at the environment and lifestyle level? Are you, what does your circadian rhythm and sleep habits look like? What do your psychological habits, how much psychological stress are you under, right? There's many different players that are going on at the environment and lifestyle level. Those are sort of the, the inputs into our body. And then the second big key is what's going on inside your body at the cellular level with your mitochondria, because our mitochondria, as I was just alluding to, are actually, they're not only picking up on these different stressors as sensors, but they're actually critical in terms of our response to various stressors. Everything from psychological stress to poor nutrition, to sleep deprivation, to environmental toxicants. They're picking up on those threats, but they're also involved in coordinating the response to them. And we know that we can either have cells that are filled with big, strong, healthy mitochondria and lots of them, or we can have cells that are filled or not so filled with mitochondria that are weak and shriveled and damaged and dysfunctional and very few of them. Okay. And we know that just to, to give you some numbers, we know from research that mitochondrial capacity on average declines about 10% with each decade of life. So we know that the average 70, 70 year old adult has 75% less mitochondrial capacity than a 20 year old, than a young adult. So what's going on there? You might be listening to this thinking, well, geez, that, that really sucks that we lose so much of our mitochondria as a result of the aging process. Well, here's the big key to understand. It's actually not a natural process of aging. It's not aging per se that's driving this process. It's the modern lifestyle and environment and specifically lack of hormetic stress. Okay, so as an analogy, and I'll loop this back into mitochondria in a second, if you have ever broken an arm or a leg, or you know someone ha who has maybe a, a friend or a child, and after six weeks or eight weeks of wearing that cast, you get the cast sawed off, and then you look down at your arm or your leg, you instantly notice two things. One, the arm or leg is really unusually hairy, and I have actually no idea why that happens, but interesting observation. And then the second big thing is the, the, the muscles, that arm or the leg has shrunk to half the size of the other one, literally in the span of just six or eight weeks. And this is because the, the body is concerned with survival and any tissue that it has it, that is not being utilized and that it, it's being communicated to the body basically, hey, we don't need this tissue for survival. We're not using it. Well, the body is ruthless. It's absolutely merciless in getting rid of any stuff that is not needed for survival. Now, this same exact process is happening in an 
on the internal level, at the cellular level with our mitochondria. Mitochondria are stimulated and challenged by exposure to hormetic stress, transient metabolic stressors, things like exercise, all the different subtypes of exercise, things like breath holding, like fasting, like heat exposure, like cold exposure, various kinds of phytochemicals. These things provide a challenge to mitochondria, just like lifting a weight is a challenge to your muscle that stimulates it to grow. These things challenge your mitochondria and stimulate them to grow. Well, just the same as if you're not using a muscle, it atrophies and shrinks. The same exact thing happens at the cellular level. If those mitochondria are not being challenged adequately, they atrophy, they shrink, they shrivel, and they die off and they become dysfunctional. And this process also, because mitochondria are so critical in our ability to respond to the stressors of life, when you lose a lot of your mitochondria, it lowers what I call your resilience threshold. It lowers their capacity to handle stress and maintain health, homeostasis, and high energy levels. So in other words, your, your body now becomes much more easily overwhelmed by the stressors of life, whether it's poor nutrition or sleep deprivation or environmental toxicants or, or psychological stress or any combination of those things. You, a weakened mitochondrial state, if you're that person who's already lost 30, 50, 70 percent of their mitochondrial capacity, your body is going to be much more easily overwhelmed by little bits of these various stressors, and then they're going to be triggered into fatigue mode. Does that all make sense? It, it does. And so on the su subject of hormetic stressors, it, it, in summary, practices like breath work, you know, hot cold therapy, high intensity interval training, intermittent fasting, all hormetic stressors are, are critical for longevity and, and making sure our vital mitochondrial function, you know, is not decreasing rapidly as we are declining rapidly as we age. So with that said, lots of different opinions on all those practices. I'm curious what you believe to be the most effective in terms of hormetic stressors. And, you know, walk us through for, for someone who's listening and saying, all right, I've heard this so many times on the show, whether it's, you know, cold therapy or some breath work or some high intensity interval training, what, do, how should I prioritize? Yeah, so I've got, yeah. you know, 10 to 15 minutes a day. How, and I don't want to, you know, I'm not interested in sarcopenia. I'm not interested in, in, in my mitochondria going to crap as I age. What do I do? So what yeah. do I do? Absolutely. Well, the answer differs a bit depending on the specific context of the individual. Are we talking about you and me, somebody who's already quite fit and energetic and healthy, or are we talking about a chronically fatigued person? So it's going to differ a bit because when you're dealing with somebody with severe chronic fatigue, exercise, particularly intense exercise, can often exacerbate their problem. So exercise is something that especially people with chronic fatigue syndrome have to be very cautious with because they can get worse really fast. Yet it's also the case that we have thousands of studies showing that exercise dramatically reduces your risk of so many different diseases and is, is clearly one of the absolute, if not the most healthy thing that we can possibly do for ourselves to live a long life and prevent disease. So there's a little bit of a paradox there. In uh, what I've found, over the years of kind of experimenting and working with thousands of people with chronic low energy levels is exercise is usually not the best place to start for someone with chronic fatigue. A couple of the types of hormesis that I really love for people with, with chronic fatigue are uh, red light therapy and near infrared light therapy, which is something I've written a book about called the ultimate guide to red light therapy. That light therapy is actually itself a hormetic stressor, even sunlight. You're getting multiple wavelengths of light that are in part, as part of their benefits, acting as a hormetic stressor at the cellular level. So that's one, one great place to start. I just saw someone this morning, a woman in my Facebook group for my Energy Blueprint program, who was saying that she thinks the, that red light therapy has actually been the major key to her recovery from chronic fatigue syndrome. So it can be a very powerful therapy for many people. Another one that I love is heat exposure, sauna use. The, the research on sauna use is just mind blowing. I mean, if you, 
if you had a prescription drug, uh, a pharmaceutical, that was shown to reduce one's risk of neurodegenerative diseases like Alzheimer's and dementia by 60 plus percent if you use it a few times per week, dramatically reduce your risk of, of cardiovascular disease um, by, by, again, 50 or 60 percent if you do it a few times per week, to fight depression, to increase performance, to improve skin health, to help with detoxification, and to decrease all-cause mortality by 60 plus percent. That's your risk of dying from any cause if you use it a few times per week, if you do that pill a few times per week. If all of that was found for a pharmaceutical, the whole world would be going crazy and saying, everybody's got to take this drug. It's the most incredible wonder drug we've ever seen. There's been nothing like this ever before. And your doctor would look at you like you're absolutely nuts if you weren't taking this drug. So the crazy thing is that drug exists. It's just not in the form of a pharmaceutical. It's in, it's in the form of a sauna. And, and that's the research on sauna use. So it's incredibly powerful. There's research. There's several studies, including case studies done with people with chronic fatigue syndrome using sauna therapy, showing that literally within the span of a couple months, people are cutting their fatigue from, you know, an eight out of 10 to a two out of 10. So it's very powerful stuff. I'm a huge fan of sauna use. One clarification on the sauna, if it's a couple of times a week, how many minutes? Yeah. So the research, what's this guy's name? He's a, he's a Finnish researcher. I name his name is Jari Laukinen or some, something like that. I'm probably butchering his name, but basically they've done studies where they've actually looked at the association between sauna use, frequency of use and duration of use in their relationship to neurological diseases, cardiovascular diseases, and all cause mortality, the risk of dying from any cause. And they've shown direct correlations between both the frequency of use and the duration of use with, based on the amount they looked at, no plateaus. So I'm sure it, as with anything, it, it will plateau eventually, meaning there's a maximal beneficial dose that if you overdo it, you know, you're going to not get any further benefits or maybe even decrease the benefits. But in the, the relationships they looked at, basically they found more is better up to as far as they were able to measure. And they measured up to daily use and up to, I believe, 30 or 40 minutes per session. They found basically the more you do it and the longer you do it, the more benefits you get, the more you reduce your risk of those diseases and die, dying, your risk of dying from any cause. So they never found the sort of the, the maximum plateau effect. So basically, based on that research, we can suggest that, hey, if you use this up to one time per day, and as long as you can tolerate, and whether that's 15 minutes or whether it's 40 minutes, that's the ideal. Now, the, these times I'm giving are also based on traditional sauna use, not infrared sauna use. Infrared saunas, this is a, a broader topic we can delve into or not, but basically the gist is there's been in recent years a lot of um, hype and a lot of people trying to market infrared saunas as being superior to traditional saunas. And the research really does not support those claims. It doesn't support a lot of the claims being made around infrared saunas. I'm not saying they're bad or necessarily that they're inferior, but there are some differences. One of the differences worth noting is that most of the research on sauna use has been done in traditional saunas rather than infrared. So we need to be cautious with extrapolating, with assuming that all of those same benefits immediately apply to infrared saunas. And the, the main reason why is that infrared saunas are typically much lower temperature. So you, most people in an infrared sauna might be in the, in the realm of 140 to 150 degrees, whereas in a traditional sauna, it might be 180 to 220 degrees. So there's a, a very significant difference there. And that also affects how long you're sitting in the sauna. It affects your, the, the expression of heat shock proteins and, and certain other physiological responses that might be amplified much more strongly by the presence of really high heat. So there are some differences there and we need to be a little bit cautious in equating them. My, my general recommendation is people who are chronically ill 
might do better with an infrared sauna because they tend to be gentler, whereas younger, fitter, healthy people tend to need more heat and to need the really high heat of more traditional saunas. And on that note, in terms of heat, what if one goes the, the direction of mother nature, whether it's a, you know, Florida, Texas, or Costa Rica, where you are in the summer, where it's very hot, any benefit or not, not really? Absolutely. I, I think, and they've actually looked at the mechanisms. Exercise itself also increases heat shock proteins, which are increased by heat, by exposure to heat. And then if you combine the two, if you're out in Texas or something like that, you're going for a bike ride on a summer day in Austin and, or in Phoenix or wherever, and you're biking. So now you're, you've got exercise, which is heating up your body and you've got the heat together. So yeah, you're definitely going to heat your body up very significantly. And it's never been tested directly, but it's totally reasonable to, to assume that a lot of, if not all of those same benefits will be had from doing that as compared with sauna use. There might be some bit of difference somewhere, but in general, there's a, a huge overlap in terms of those responses. And if those modalities work really well for those who are suffering from chronic fatigue, what about, I would say the average person who, you know, feels pretty good, but you know, maybe grabbing for coffee around 2 PM or a snack, who just feels like they, they drag a little bit, which I think is the majority of Americans. I feel like they feel like something's maybe a little off, but I feel fine, but you know, got a case of the forties, so to speak, or a case of the thirties or what, however you want to think about it. Yeah. Well, certainly, uh, I mean, for people who don't have chronic fatigue, doing exercise of some kind, whether it's more steady state endurance or weight training or high intensity interval training or sprint interval training, uh, whatever it is that appeals to you that you will actually do consistently is huge. One other type of hormetic stress that I'm a huge fan of, particularly for people who, who have chronic low energy levels is actually breath holding practices, which called in the scientific literature, intermittent hypoxic training. And the research on this, as far as the adaptations it's stimulating in your body are very interesting. It's actually remodeling the lung blood interface to some degree. So your body can actually extract more oxygen and drop off more carbon dioxide. It's also remodeling the physical interface between the blood and the cell and the mitochondria so that they all become more efficient at extracting oxygen and utilizing oxygen to produce energy, simultaneously becoming also more resistant to low oxygen states, which protects against oxidative damage. So there's a, a huge array of, of really amazing benefits from that practice. And the other nice part about it is unlike exercise, it doesn't, you don't expend and use up a lot of energy stores in your body. Unlike, you know, as with, as you do with exercise, which is actually a huge factor for people with chronic fatigue. So if you can stimulate a lot of these hormetic adaptations at the mitochondrial level without a huge caloric expenditure, that's often very, very beneficial. And I will say that in my, this is a big statement, but I think it's true. In my experience, the intermittent hypoxic training practices are the single fastest and most powerful way to improve energy levels in people with chronic low energy. And can you walk us through what that would look like for someone? Sure. Yeah. There's a number of different ways of doing this. Everything from traditional free diving breath hold practices that, you know, have been done for decades and decades by, by you know, I mean, traditional divers, you know, there's tribes in the, in the South Pacific, for example, that have been holding their breath to do, to hunt for food and can hold their breath for minutes and walk on the seafloor. So I guess it's been done this sort of since time immemorial, but in terms of modern research, we have uh, free diving practices, which are more holding on the inhale. So you might do some calming, relaxing, breathing, blowing off lots of CO2, and then hold on the inhale and you can hold as long as you want. This is something that could be done in a sitting position, just meditating in, in complete stillness or in a laying position in complete relaxation. 
or it could be done obviously in water, though I definitely don't advise anybody to do breath holding practices in water unless you know what you're doing and you've got other people around you because if you pass out there, you can die. Whereas if you pass out on land, laying in your chair or on your floor, you're gonna wake up and everything's gonna be fine. Um, so there's those kinds of practices. They can also be done in while walking and while moving your body. And I would do it while walking on grass or sand at the beach or something like that, rather than on cement. I don't want to scare people. You're unlikely to pass out, but it's always a possibility. And, and then there's other practices that have been popularized by Wim Hof, but they're sort of ancient Tibetan practices is where those originate called Tumo breathing. And these are practices where you do some kind of hyperventilation beforehand, typically 30 to 50 breaths of a very deep, full inhale, and then a partial exhale. And there's variations on this practice. It can be done Wim Hof style, which is in and out through the mouth, or it can be done through the nose, which is sometimes called alkaline breathing or DMT breathing, or it can be done, you know, sometimes people will do fire breathing, which is kind of a pranayama technique from the yogic tradition. So these would be the Wim Hof breathing is the alkaline or DMT breathing is the same, just in through the nose. And then the fire breathing is in and out through the nose, quickly pumping the belly. So, so you do some variation of that for, let's say, 30 to 50 breaths, typically. And then you blow out all your air, unlike the free diving practices where you hold on the inhale. Here you would blow out all the air, hold on the exhale with no air in your lungs, and try to hold as long as you can. And the benefit of doing it this way is, first of all, you won't be able to hold as long as compared to if you were holding on an in-breath, but it does drop your, your blood oxygen levels to a lower state much more rapidly. So people can much more reliably actually get into a true hypoxic, low oxygen state and stimulate some of those benefits, those adaptations to that low oxygen state. So... Yeah, basically it's really that simple and you can do anywhere between, you know, if you're starting out, maybe you only do two rounds. If you're starting out and you're chronically fatigued, especially go easy. You start with, you know, something very gentle, maybe a couple breath holds uh, with an in-breath and you're holding for, maybe you're only holding for 15 or 20 seconds. And then you can work your way up. I have a whole program called Breathing for Energy where we've broken it down into to eight different training levels, everything from... 10 to 15 second breath holds up to three minutes and beyond of breath holds uh, while, while holding without any air in the lungs. So yeah, I mean, there's a lot you can work towards, but I found that if you do that, even for a month, you, I, I've seen really dramatic transformations in people's energy levels just from this one practice. So in terms of exercise, more and more science has shown that maintaining muscle mass is absolutely critical in, in terms of longevity. And so you think of maintaining muscle mass, you obviously have to figure out how you're going to work out, do some strength training and lots of different ways you can approach that. And then invariably the question comes up, you need protein. Well then how much protein is enough? And then what about sources of protein? How do you think about th that big question? how much protein is enough if I want to maintain muscle mass? And then what types of protein? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a big question and uh, also a controversial topic. You have everything from the vegans who are warning about high protein consumption due to too much mTOR to the now carnivore people who are saying plants are trying to kill you and really you should eat nothing but meat. Well, we'll, we'll, we'll approach it. We've got an audience that's open-minded and lots of different diets. So talk yep. about, you know, I guess animal sources of protein and also plant-based protein. So we got something for everyone. Yeah. The gist of it is there are claims out there that they're really the same. That there are no significant differences. And hey, we can cite this study saying, you know, that that looked at pea protein consumption versus whey protein consumption or something like that, or soy versus whey in people looking to gain muscle mass. So studies like that exist. There's also among the, the animal food consumption proponents, there's claims that, you know, animal proteins are, are just vastly superior. I would say if I can summarize in a succinct way without getting too bogged down in lots of nuances and details, there is, there is definitely a case to be made that in general, an equivalent amount of animal protein, let's say 20 grams of 
chicken or fish or eggs or whey protein is generally going to be superior to 20 grams of protein from lentils and, and rice and, and beans and, and grains and things like that. However, there are definitely studies, as I just mentioned, where they've actually looked in people who are resistant and they've compared soy protein powder or rice protein powder or pea protein powder to whey, which is kind of considered the gold standard of animal proteins in terms of protein powders and resistance exercise in particular. And many of those studies have shown equivalent gains. So based on those studies, it, it, it's definitely clear that it's not really warranted to sort of position plant proteins as these just worthless, totally inferior things that aren't doing anything and only animal proteins do something. That's definitely not the case. But in general, if you're a vegan or vegetarian, it is prudent to eat more overall protein and to sort of um, take extra care to go above and beyond your protein requirements by eating protein-rich plant foods and by also, I, I would say, ideally, given the importance, as you said, of, of avoiding sarcopenia and maintaining muscle mass, uh, also considering using plant-based protein powders. So that, that would be my sort of general thoughts. Those are great general thoughts too. And plant, if one's concerned about increasing mTOR, which we've talked about on the show, not what you want when you start to get, I think, above age 40, you don't have to be as concerned if you're consuming plant-based protein. Do I have that correct? Well, you know, I would say there's a misconception around mTOR in general. I, I think it's been framed by a lot of, I would say, especially sort of vegan diet gurus that mTOR is just this bad thing. And the, the more mTOR you have, the, the more disease you're going to have, the more cancer you're going to have, the lower, the, the shorter your lifespan is going to be. And there's actually a U-shaped curve between mTOR and lifespan, meaning too low of mTOR is just as harmful as too much. So you don't want to just avoid mTOR and be in a fasted state all the time and not eat any protein because you're afraid of mTOR. And I mean, resistance exercise also stimulates mTOR. The truth is mTOR plays a vital role in our body as far as stimulating anabolic tissue building processes. We, we don't want to just frame it like it's this bad thing that we need to avoid all the time, but chronically stimulating mTOR which is largely re the result of like the standard American diet of just over consuming food and calories more broadly uh, beyond what your body needs is and, and having too long of a feeding window from the time from your first bite of food to your last bite of food each day and not allowing for adequate dips in mTOR and catabolic autophagy processes during the nighttime period is absolutely to toxic and will contribute to cancer. But at the, at the same time, again, we need to avoid framing mTOR as a bad thing and like the less we have of it. We want spikes of mTOR stimulation, particularly from resistance exercise, and we wanna pair that resistance exercise with consuming plenty of protein to stimulate those anabolic muscle building processes. So, so you mentioned consuming plenty of protein. Let's close the loop on protein. I, I know we're all individuals and, and the number can vary, but in your estimation, is there a general rule of thumb? If I want to maintain or build muscle mass, is it half a gram per pound, two gram? Like, how do you think about what is enough protein based on body weight? Well, there, there's a number of studies. There's, a, there's been studies where they've looked at, you know, young resistance training males and how to optimize muscle gain in response to, in response to lifting weights. There's also lots of studies um, in sort of middle-aged people who are looking to achieve fat loss, which is another important factor in both longevity, disease prevention, and energy levels. Having too much body fat in addition to too little muscle mass is they're both big contributors to fatigue and disease and, and early death. And in that context, there's been meta-analyses of randomized controlled trials done where they've shown consistently that around 0.8 to 1 gram per pound of body weight, a uh, gram of protein per pound of body weight, or in kilograms, it's 1.1 to 1.6 grams of protein per kilogram uh, per day, increases fat loss. So increases your fat loss results, preserves muscle mass or causes muscle gain, and preserves resting metabolic rate and leads to higher energy levels all of which are critical for maintenance of 
fat loss and maintenance of good body composition after the dietary period is over. So I think somewhere in that range is optimal, which some people are going to perceive as high. I think, you know, within the vegan crowd, they're going to say, oh my gosh, that's way too much. Really, we only need, you know, 30 or 40 grams of protein per day. And that's what the, the have established is necessary for humans to, to stay alive. Well, that's the thing that that's true. That is the minimum amount required to stay alive. But there's a big distinction between what is the minimum required of something to be alive versus what's <laughs> optimal for optimizing body composition or lifespan or energy levels. It makes a lot of sense. In closing, I want to bring it back to nutrition. You mentioned a couple of times eating a nutritious diet. That can mean so many different things to, to, to many different people. And we always love a good superfood list here at Mind Buddy Green. And so without going down the whole rabbit hole of food philosophy, let's close with a good superfood list. In the book, I love how you break it down. You've got fruits, microalgae, garnishes, nut seeds and fatty fruits, fibrous vegetables, animal based proteins, whole grains, legumes. So lots there, lots of great categories. If you were to name your, your top five superfoods that are probably going to be good for everybody. And again, you know, we're, we're, we're going we're to generalize here. What, what are your top five superfoods? Okay. I'm going to list a couple animal foods here. I might give you more than five. Maybe I'll do six here. As, as in terms of animal foods that I consider superfoods, I'd say liver, um, beef liver, especially is in, it's, it's like nature's multivitamin. I mean, it's just packed with, uh, with vitamins that our body needs and, and as well as some important minerals. Oysters are another one. Oysters are actually also a great food for people who are vegetarians or what's called sentiocentris. I, I won't get into too much depth around that, but there's some vegans who have actually made the case that eating oysters should be okay, largely as a result of basically analyzing what is the capacity of this animal for pain and suffering. And based on the fact they don't have a nervous system and don't respond to any sort of painful inputs, there, there is a case made by many vegans that it's actually okay to eat oysters and being so rich in, in key nutrients that are typically deficient on a plant-based diet. I, I would argue that oysters would be a great addition for most people on a plant-based diet, um, particularly the omega-3s in the form of DHA and EPA and B12 and selenium and zinc. Salmon roe is another great another great animal food that I'd highly recommend. Extremely rich in omega-3s and in the phospholipid form. And it turns out phospholipids, this is something that's, that's very neglected, I think, by most people. But the phospholipids that are in that can actually help replace damaged phospholipids in our cellular and mitochondrial membranes. So that's those are a few wonderful animal foods that I'd recommend. Uh, in terms of plant foods, I would say broccoli sprouts are incredible many benefits, anti-cancer, anti-neurological disease. They act as a hormetic stressor for mitochondria, boosting mitochondrial health, stimulating mitochondrial biogenesis, stimulating detoxification processes, many, many benefits there. Beets are another wonderful one that have been shown in studies to enhance endurance performance and the time to exhaustion and energy levels, largely as a result of helping the circulatory system, helping blood flow easier and deliver oxygen to the tissues. Pomegranate is another amazing one. Also has some of those benefits that beets have. And there's a compound, pomegranates are uniquely rich in a compound called elagic acid or elagitanins that is turned into by our gut microbiome, turned into a compound called urolithin A, which it turns out is one of the most powerful stimulators of mitophagy, basically helping our body to break down damaged mitochondria and rebuild healthy mitochondria. So that's an amazing thing there. I absolutely love pomegranates. And the last one I'll mention is spirulina. Spirulina is not just some, you know, new age hippie nonsense. There is incredible research on spirulina helping so many different conditions, everything from combating cardiometabolic diseases to helping people lose weight to improving infl inflammatory markers, decreasing oxidative stress, improving blood lipids, improving blood pressure, improving insulin resistance, and research also on performance in 
in terms of physical activity and energy levels. Spirulina is maybe number one on that list. It's really that the research is pretty incredible when you look at that. Wow. I love it. Phenomenal list. Ari, thank you so much. Yeah, my pleasure. Thanks for having me.